Hello and welcome to another episode here of Taxel Titans. Uh, this is actually the second episode here that we're doing. Uh, I'm Shade Frey, although I'm here with Stephen Swenson. Uh, he's also uh, the other uh, the other half of this. Yeah, it's it's good to be here today. We're excited to do episode two. Uh, we've got a lot of good things to go over today. A lot of good topics and some some interesting properties to look at as well. Yeah, so a uh, ton of stuff we want to cover here. Uh, for starters, though, we want to give a special thanks, I think, to all of our website members. Uh, you know, we have people that have been with us for years now. And so really, uh, we just have a lot of gratitude for them and for, uh, you know, for being members and for, you know, some of the followers that people, I mean, I was just actually going over memberships today. We have people that have been following us for um, for years since uh, since 2017, 18. Yeah, yeah, definitely. We want to appreciate all the members of TaxSelfSupport.com. Also, all of our YouTube members. We've started a YouTube membership program, and so we want to uh, give you guys a shout out as well and thank uh, everyone who's following us, all of our subscribers. We appreciate it. Uh, so let's talk about the lineup, what we're going to be talking about here today. It, we're going to be covering a ton of stuff. So first, we're going to discuss uh different news and updates we actually have a whole bunch of events that we're doing and uh, so we're going to be talking about those for a minute then we're going to get into the training tip of the week uh from there we will go into the deal of the week where we're going to review some different properties there uh, some great properties that'll be fun uh, then we're going to cover a uh a questions from subscribers section uh then we're going to be doing uh the uh what were they thinking section uh then we're also going to be reviewing a student deal um, and uh, and that'll wrap things up. Yeah, a lot of good things to go through. So uh, let's get into it and let's talk about uh, some news. Uh, now, before that, uh, um, if any of you guys haven't downloaded our free ebook at Secrets of Tax Lean Investing, go ahead and check it out. You can download our ebook. You can also uh, set up uh, or schedule uh, a, a webinar uh, or be part of one of our upcoming webinars. So there's a lot of information there you can check out. Yeah, you bet. <clears throat> Yeah, uh, for news and announcements here, first, um, I was going to talk about our event schedule. So uh, we actually have a lot of events that are happening almost um, every single week. Uh, and in fact, we, uh, we we just wrapped up one here in, uh, in Florida. And uh, the next event that we have coming up is going to be uh, October 28th through the 30th. And that'll be in Houston. Uh, after that, in November, so the 4th through the 6th, we're going to be in San Francisco. Uh, then the 11th through the 13th of November, we're going to be back in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Uh, then uh, November 18th to the 20th, we'll be in Philadelphia. Uh, then in December, we actually have two events. Um, on the 2nd through the 4th of December, we're going to be in Phoenix. And then uh, the 9th to the 11th, we're going to be in Austin, Texas. Yeah, so we've got a lot of good events uh, throughout the country uh, between now and the new year, and we're looking at the schedule for next year. We're putting together uh, new events uh, in different markets. And so uh, if you're interested in attending, it's only $299 at least uh, for uh, some of these events that we have coming up. And that also is including six months worth of membership for any of the early bird people. So if you're interested in, let us know and we can get you that 299 price plus the six month membership. Yeah, yeah, because I think actually, you know, the at some point the event price is gonna go back up to the to the 499. And so uh, if you, you know, to get that, that you know that 299 price you definitely want to jump in on the early bird special on that yeah also as far as some upcoming uh, sales upcoming news bid for assets has just uh, uh posted some california auctions a bunch of washington auctions also new jersey has a bunch of tax lien auctions that are coming up on realauction.com so if you're interested in, in looking at taxing sales you can check that out and we're getting to the time of year now where colorado is starting to post their list yeah yeah, so there will be some good, uh, some good tax lien auctions coming up here. There. Well, now we are to the training tip of the day, um, and the topic that we're going to be talking about is uh, we're going to be talking about county records and the role that they play and how we basically use them to uh, to find information because we actually spend a lot of time in county records. They are a fundamental aspect of how we do research, how we obtain information. So uh, they're definitely an important topic when it comes to any of the uh, the research or work that we do with, with properties. Yeah, I mean, really, it's tax sale investors. It's our number one um, search tool. 
Uh, it's the number one place we're going to go to to find out information about the property, find out if it's something we're going to be interested in and they're not. Now, county records are completely open to the public. They're public records, but that doesn't necessarily mean that all of these records are available online. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> so when um, when it said that they're public records, what it means is really just that uh, if somebody from the public would like access to them, you know, that they, um, they're they're supposed to provide that. Uh, but for the longest time, that's something that was always done in person. You know, that was something that you know they they would you'd go there to a county records building, and um, so they would have these things like the deed itself. You know, property deeds would be there, are you know, on site and recorded there. So if you're doing research, you're doing it there on site with their with their records, um, which was how even property assessments and everything was done here before the internet. Um, so <clears throat> the way it works now is. It seems like most counties now have been adding records and have tried to make, uh, you know, records a part of what they do. They have websites now because, you know, that just allows them to be able to, uh, you know, provide or help, you know, the, uh, you know, help the residents, but without having all the man hours and all the people they have to provide. Yeah, in fact, as Shade was talking about that, it kind of flashed me back to an old memory when we first got started uh, looking into taxing investing. And, and there was a couple of different books. Uh, there wasn't a lot of information actually available out, uh, available, and that was just really where the internet was starting to change things. And we were interested in looking in, in tax liens in Arizona. And as we started to, to look into it, we were interested in over the counters because we were interested in that 16% interest and be able to pick ones you know, after the auction. And I remember the process was, was sending them you know, nearly $200 and then they sent us back this huge list, but there wasn't a lot of that information online. And so you actually had to take that down to Arizona at the county courthouse and try to go through those individually, uh, you know, look up those paper records and, and slowly start county started adding those online. Uh, and, and now we're to the point where most counties have, have added them. Now there's still going to be counties where we can't find maybe some of the uh, assessor records or tax collector records, but most counties are going to at least have that information available to us as part of the public record. It saves time from people needing to go down to the county courthouse, saves them time and staff in, in, in being able to put it online. So I think we're going to see more and more counties put this information and make it available online, which like we've seen over the last really 15 or 20 years. Yeah, well, there I think there have always but we'll always run into counties that, that don't quite have the records up to date. But I'm impressed all the time by uh, even smaller counties and some of the records that they have available now. Um, so when it comes to the uh, county departments that we focus on um, and records even, you know, we can also divide records into these departments. Uh, there are three departments we generally look at. Um, they are the treasurer or tax collector, you know, which uh, are basically going to be the uh, a lot of times they can be either the same thing or depending on different areas might call them different things. So the treasurer or the tax collector, we have the assessor um, and then the county recorder or um, you know the, uh, the sometimes it's the uh, the clerk of the court. Uh, they can have different names for it. But those are basically the three essential offices. Those are also the three types of records that we focus on. Uh, treasurer records, which are tax related records, assessor, uh, assessor records, which are generally um, property related records, and then uh, you know the recorder's records, which are generally uh, legal records or court records. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, and the first two are are generally going to be good enough for tax lien investing. Your general tax lien, where you're just bidding down the interest, there's no premium bid, anything like that. Usually, going through the the tax records, the assessor records, it's going to give us the information we need to make an informed decision. In addition to those assessor records, something that we use a lot as tax sale investors because we invest in a lot of land in tax sale properties are going to be the online maps, the, the GIS maps. Uh, these are going to be where we're going to go, these online maps to, to research the property in more detail and in some cases find out really where the property lines are at. Yeah, in fact, it's one of the first things that we are looking for, um, you know, when, when we when we go into any of these departments, we're trying to pull up maps uh, so that we can locate them. Um, now, uh, these are generally pretty easy to find if we can locate county websites. If we can find county websites, then from there, uh, we're always, it's easy to navigate because uh, once we can pull up county websites, uh, then we're usually just looking at something like uh, the 
the elected officials tab or departments tab, uh, because from there we can usually find the uh, the department or the elected official that we're looking for. Yeah, definitely. Well, and, and w if we just go to a Google search and type in the county name, state, uh, and uh, a couple of keywords, you know, even county, uh, it'll usually with within the first couple of uh, Google search, first couple of search results is going to have uh, a link to the county records. They're very prominently posted. And then from there, we can look through and find the department that handles the taxes, uh, the treasurer, the tax collector. Uh, it really, it, it, it becomes a lot easier as we're looking online to be able to pull up that information. And as we go to the county website, it's usually going to be listed under the assessor uh, or uh, under the department's head. Yeah, so we can see here, you know, under um, under clerk's records, you know, that top search there is is, uh, is for the portal we're actually looking for there. Um, you know, the the, uh, the clerk of the court uh, online records right there. Looks like the official records. Yeah, definitely. Well, and there's a lot of different names or keywords that we can use when looking up these records. Uh, you know, official records, court, public, deed records. Uh, clerk records, land records, all of these keywords are going to be able to help us find the de different departments that we're looking for. Excellent. So once we uh, are able to locate, you know, the correct department, um, you know, what information is it that we're generally looking for? Um, and, uh, you know, and how do we pull it up? So uh, a lot of times uh, we'll use some kind of identification number like the parcel number, but you sometimes using the parcel number um, doesn't work. You know, we don't always find the property, you know, the first time we try to, to locate it using the parcel number. And so uh, because of that, we also learn how to find, you know, properties using things like the, uh, the owner name or uh, even the property address. There's a lot of different things we can actually use to identify the property. Yeah, definitely. We're always going to, like Shade said, we're always going to start with the parcel number. Uh, that's usually going to be the, the easiest way to start. And also one thing to bring up about the parcel number is we, mean, we may need to delete dashes. We may need to add dashes. Uh, all parcel search tools are not going to be the same. Uh, sometimes we're going to need to practice a little bit if we're not able to pull it up. And in fact, sometimes we'll go ahead and try searching using the owner's name or the address if we're having problems pulling up the part using the parcel number. Yeah, so uh, what we're usually looking for when we get to a department, like we uh, will usually go to the assessor's office if we're looking for a records hub for uh, assessment records information or property records. That's usually going to be found within, uh, within the assessor section of the website. Um, and we're usually trying to plug in a parcel number there to locate a property record. But if it doesn't work, uh, you know, then it may be because we have dashes or we need to put in dashes or maybe there's spaces there. There can be a lot of different reasons why a parcel search tool might not pull up a result there initially. And so, yeah, that's why it's nice that they always give you lots of other options for locating, you know, that specific property record. And when we do find the record, we can usually see there how the parcel numbers, you know, uh, how it's recorded and you know therefore be able to get it into the search tool so the searches we do after that will work yeah yeah that's a good point i mean if as we look in there in the county record we can see do they include the dash in their parcel number and that'll help us be able to uh, search that uh, as we go back and search on the parcel number in the parcel search tool yeah so these uh, what we're doing here is we're reviewing a couple of different types of of uh, property records and what we're looking at here is a uh, a tax record and uh, what's nice about a tax record uh, is that it's a very specific type of record, but it, it tells us what's going on there with the history of the property. And a lot of times it can actually tell you um, quite a bit about uh, historically, you know, what's happened with the property taxes and the payment of those property taxes uh, or the lack of payment. You know, like in this case, uh, you know, we're looking at uh, the, you know, the tax history of a property, but we can see all the years that the taxes were paid and then years when the taxes weren't paid. Uh, and the, you know, even times when it was nearly lost to foreclosure. Yeah, in fact, if we're looking here at the tax history record, we can see back in 2015 that they actually had a tax deed application filled out or uh, put on the property, which means that back in 2014 and 13, they actually had tax liens on the property where one of those lien holders went ahead and filled out the deed application. It was uh, sent to a deed foreclosure, and then the, and then the property owner came and paid that off and then paid for the next couple of years and started becoming a delinquent again. And eventually uh, one of those lien holders 
uh, filled out another deed application, which is sending it to the tax cell now. Yeah, now um, a record like this is especially important uh, if we are investing in, let's say, tax liens in, in certain states. So, uh, for instance, in Florida, it is important because uh, in Florida, there can be up to seven years worth of back taxes um, you know, owed against the property that can be valid. And if we ever want to foreclose on a tax lien, so let's say we were thinking about buying a tax lien against, uh, you know, against the property. Uh, if there are other liens against the property, then it's going to be our obligation to basically pay off those liens um, in order to foreclose. So, um, you know, it's it's one of those things where if if the property doesn't redeem on its own, which most of the time it will, but if it doesn't, then you know we need to be prepared to go through the steps, you know, to foreclose on the property and pay off those liens. If necessary, and so it's important to know how much they are for, you know, before you buy. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, in, in looking up roll up, which is something we've talked about before, uh, that's going to be, you know, incredibly important, especially within certain states, uh, states where uh, they they have four, five, six, seven years uh, worth of delinquent taxes before those tax liens no longer become valid. For example, within Florida after a period of seven years, that tax lien will no longer become valid. And essentially the the owner of that tax lien will lose their interest, lose their money in the, in the property. And so they're, what they're trying to do is force somebody to fill out the deed application to send it to a deed foreclosure where it can get sold and all the investors get paid. Yeah, it's basically all depending on what the statute of limitations is um, for that sale specific state. You know, so uh, yeah, in Florida, they're at seven years, but every state has a little bit different. Uh, now, what we're looking at here is the assessor's uh, record example here, or basically it's a good example of a property record. Um, now, Florida counties do them the best, you know, if we're just being kind of frank. I think that they've always been um, you know, some of the best providers of records that were easy to navigate and, and easy to, uh, to consume information with. Uh, and, you know, this is a good example of that. You know, we have everything divided up into nice little detailed sections where we have, you know, the property details it includes the zoning information and the legal description. We have owner information listed there. Then we've got sales. Then we have the improvement information, you know, listed uh, you know, below that, which has, you know, tells us when it was built, what kind of property it is, uh, you know, then what the tax values are, you know, below that. Um, this is a very easy way to uh, to be able to digest information. Yeah, well, as we're looking at this record, you know, really, we can we can make a good determination if this is a property that we're interested in in researching more. If it's a tax deed property, or if it's a tax lien property, we may do a, a few additional things. We may check it out on Google Maps, see if there's any street side imagery. We may go ahead and, and check out the the value as well. But once we've done that, that's really good enough for us to go ahead and purchase a tax and certificate in, in a lot of scenarios, especially in just a bid down the interest rate scenario. Uh, we can see what this property is, like Shade mentioned up there within the property information. We can see it's a condominium. We can see it's two bedroom, two bath, built in 1972, uh, just over a thousand square feet. Uh, one thing as well we can see is down in the, in the, in the bottom left-hand corner, we can also see the sales information when the property is sold, if it was sold with a quick claim deed, if it was sold with a warranty deed, and then we also have links that will directly take us and help us pull up the deed. So right there on the county records, we can connect to the deed information. We can also connect to the online maps. We can connect to the tax collector record information. And there's even many times uh, links that we can click on to get comparable sales within the area. Yeah, which we have that right here in this case too. So, uh, you know, what some, something we're always looking for as well is uh, access to the full map, the GIS mapping. Uh, and, you know, at the top of this one, we have both access to their full map plus uh, the nearby sales search, which this is something we're seeing more and more with uh, within, uh, within county websites, uh, tools that make it easy to find comps, you know, where you can go through and find a lot of comps, you know, very, very simply. So yeah, very good example of that type of a record. But uh, you know, GIS maps have changed quite a few things uh, because they're so much faster and easier to get through and be able to identify properties. And uh, because you can learn so much from different types of maps that are now available, 
uh, on properties. You know, um, uh, maps, in fact, play a pretty important role when we are seeking out, uh, you know, when we're looking for investment properties. In fact, it's one of the first things we're looking for. Yeah, well, I mean, it's going to be really helpful for structured properties. We can see approximately where the lot lines are at. We can see what it looks like around other property, but it's really going to be helpful in land as well because we may not have an address. We just may have a street. And so uh, using the, the online maps uh, will help us go ahead and, and find that information. Also, one thing to mention about those online maps is they do have base maps. And those base maps allow us to uh, really research a bunch of additional information on the property. Uh, for example, flood zones, uh, if there's topographical issues, uh, anything like that, a lot of times we can find that information by using the base maps on the online maps. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes it's a matter of, uh, well, you've got to play around with them. They have layers. Uh, sometimes we have multiple years of, of overhead satellite images. Um, you know, there's a lot of tools there that are pretty handy to use. And so we're always looking for the GIS mapping. Um, the uh, the court records um, or the recorder's records are another area that we that we go into or that we search. Um, you know, in this case, we can see on the left-hand side uh, we have a uh, essentially a search tool. You know, that is there that allows you to uh, you know, gives you different uh, uh, different criteria that you can use and set. You know, to to search through the records. And then on the right-hand side, we have the results of a search. Yeah, yeah, well, and this is where we're going to be searching for any type of governmental liens. For, so for uh, if we are investing in a tax deed property, uh, we're going to need to research and see is there any issues, is there anything that we need to be worried, worried about, and the most common being some type of utility lien. I mean, even looking in this particular property result, the only thing that we can see of, of consequence is the, is the foreclosure, which is the tax deed foreclosure which means that for this particular property that we're investigating right here, there's not any type of government liens that we need to be worried about. So really, it's just a matter of figuring out the property value and then determining our high bid. Yeah, yeah. In other words, you know, I mean, if we're looking at, um, you know, at this property here, which, uh, you know, which we're looking at, I think it has the same name here on it. Um, and, you know, so it's this Barbary. We're looking through this and we're interested to find any liens that are going to be attached to the property it's going to be under her name and so when we do uh, look underneath uh, her name if that's all we can find you know under under this barbary are those results there uh, then we can be pretty sure that we're not going to find any kind of liens against the property you know, you know, because they should be there if they were listed. Yeah, would you turn it back to that assessor record real quick? As you were talking about Barbara Reed, it just kind of gave me an idea on something I wanted to quickly pull out, uh, sh show out, show is is right there uh, underneath the owner's name in the site address. And and that's going to tell us if the property is, is you know, owner occupied or is it something else? Is it a rental? Is it, you know, a summer property? And so a lot of times just through that information, we can automatically, it's going to tell us something about the property if it is owner occupied or if it isn't. All right, now let's go back up here. And just uh, some final thoughts on it uh, for the other records that we use. Uh, you know, the county records are such a big part of everything that we do that uh, really that's where a lot of the research happens. That's where we find properties and learn about properties, uh, you know, as well as using the maps uh, and, you know, becoming, uh, you know, becoming, uh, I guess, uh, you fluent with the maps, you could say, uh, you know, learning how to uh, to navigate them and, uh, and find information, uh, all different types of information. Uh, you know, really all of these records are uh, records we use on a daily basis. Yeah, yeah, definitely. The tax records, uh, property oh. records, and the court records. Sorry, let me back up there a second. Okay, so uh, with that being said, we're going to move on here to the next section uh, that we have here. Um, you know, but before we do that, um, you know, if you haven't been to uh, to uh, secretsoftaxinginvesting.com yet, uh, this is somewhere you can go to uh, to download the information, uh, download the ebooks that we have. You can also uh, register there for free webinars that we hold. Um, yeah, and you know, and also uh, go ahead and subscribe. And we just want to give a quick shout out 
to uh, some of the feedback that we get. We love the comments within within our YouTube comments, and we just want to thank you know Jimmy, Yah, uh, Melrose, Johnny, Brian. Uh, for leaving those type of, of positive comments. Really, we go through and read them, we respond to them. Sometimes it takes us a week or two to get to it, depending on how busy we are. But we do read all of the comments and we try to respond to all of them as well. Yeah, thank you. Okay, now the next section that we have here is for the deal of the week. Um, so, uh, for uh, for today's deal of the week here, we're going to be reviewing some properties that were sold in uh, in uh, one of the Michigan County sales for Saginaw. So this is a sale that actually took place on September 14th. We're going to be lo looking at a few of the deals from that sale because there were some excellent property deals uh, that came out of this auction. So uh, we're going to look at uh, just little portions here of these, and we're going to actually go and look at uh, at each one of these properties because they include everything from uh, functional gas stations to uh, you know, I think commercial properties here and some homes, lots of homes. Yeah, so we're going to go ahead and jump online and go check them out. All right, so the first thing we're going to do. This was an auction that, that took place uh, last month, uh, an online auction through the Michigan uh, auctions. Michigan has their auctions, uh, and they take place usually between the, the, you know, kind of the month of September into, into uh, the early part of October. So really in around about a 45 days, all of the counties within Michigan will go ahead and conduct their auctions. And what we're doing here is, is looking at, at one of the past sales. All right, let's get this pulled over here. All right, and what we're doing here is we're going to look at the past auction results. We're going to go here for the most recent year, and then we're going to scroll down here because this is one that happened, uh, and it's actually right. Let's scroll down a little further here because it's right before the end here. Oh, and there we go. All right, so this was uh, the results here of the Saginaw sale, and we're going to look at uh, a number of different properties here that uh, that sold. Uh, so the first one that we are going to look at actually um, is a functioning gas station here that sold. So let's pull this up. Well, and to be honest, we're not 100% sure if this was a good deal or not. Uh, you know, it 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 at the price. You know, it, it seems like it was quite a bit of money, but really, from this particular with this particular property, it's it's not really even a matter of how much the land is valued. It's a matter of how much income it brings. This is an income producing property. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it it looks like it was still functioning. You know, up to the time here, you know, the, the photo was taken. So, yeah, it is an income producing property. Uh, it sold for two hundred ninety thousand, so it didn't sell for a cheap amount. But yeah, like Steve said, it's really all about how much income it produces. It has an SCV uh, that would put it at about you know one hundred and seventy thousand or so uh, would be the the assessed value. But that doesn't really tell us what the market really is on it. Well, and in some markets, you know, a, a starter home may be 290000 mm -hmm. So if you wanted to buy a rental property within your area, uh, you know, and let's say it costs two or $300,000 to do it, uh, you know, that rental property may bring between 1000 to $2,000 in rental income. Yeah. Maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less, but probably right in around that, in that, around that range. This property is probably going to bring three or four times that amount in, in, in rental income. So, you know, dollar per dollar, there was a lot that was spent on here. And we don't know enough about this market, enough about commercial property to say, you know, what the potential value is with this. With, with, real, with residential, sometimes the commercial land, we, we can put a, a better estimate. Even, even an office building, we can do a better estimate. Something like this is not really within our wheelhouse, but it is an interesting deal. And the 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 potential is is huge. I mean, you could automatically just rent it to the person that's doing it now, or you could uh, you know take it on yourself. It really gives a lot of uh, potential. Yeah. Let's see. Let's take a look at uh, some of the other properties we have here that um, that sold. 
Okay, so uh, we have, let's see the numbers here, 81.27. Let's pull up that one here first. Uh, 81.27 is another really interesting commercial property here that sold. So this property sold for 95,000. Um, the opening minimum bid on it was 45,000. So it sold for, uh, you know, about double that amount, but it has an SEV, uh, which, you know, again, that's the Michigan assessed value. Um, and you have to, you have to multiply it by two to figure out what the value is of 262,000. So that would put the, uh, the estimated market uh, assessed value on the property about 200 and I mean, 500 and 40. Uh, yeah, roughly 522. Oh, yeah, 522. You know, or 524,000, roughly. <laughs> We're terrible at math here. Uh, but yeah, let's take a few looks at the images here because that's another th the great thing about the Michigan sales is uh, that they, they're required by law to take images, you know, uh, to basically put a sign in front of the property and take images of that. Um, and so when they take images of properties, they take way more and their current images that's the other nice thing about it is we're not looking at old images we're looking at current images that included a few images there of the roof you know place their roof was tore up a bit but this is a relatively new or newer uh, office building we can see an overhead image of it right here well and they were highlighting the the damage there which you know really is limited look like mm -hmm. a, you know a three or four foot piece yeah. of, of area we're talking about a, a potential property here that has warehouse space, has, you know, probably office space, many different type of uses, and and really probably a value. Let's say it is worth, you know, I probably think it's it's worth more than the assessed value shows it is. So if they say it's it's worth, you know, five hundred and just on, over five hundred thousand, I would imagine based on the size of the property uh, that it's probably worth. Uh, probably worth quite a bit more than that 15,000 square feet yeah so it's yeah, I mean you're talking about a massive property yeah 15,000 square feet so yeah uh, awesome property you know very cool and it was purchased for 95,000 that could very well be like like a tenth of value you know this property could actually have this property could be worth a lot of money I mean even if we're just looking at the the assessed value Mm -hmm. You're looking at at twenty cents on the dollar. Oh, look at that! Look at that. Um, base cost new of upper floors, one point one million. Yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, that's you know that's that's kind of where it was in my in my head. Yeah. You know, so that's that, that's like one point two million. Basically, was kind of like the replacement cost. Yeah. So yeah, to, to recreate this would cost you one point two million dollars, and it was picked up for ninety five thousand. Whoa, that's crazy to think somebody made a, somebody basically. Uh, yeah, we'll see what they sell it for, but you know, but they made a million dollars with this purchase. Yeah, well, as as we go through and see some of these deals that we weren't a part of or our students weren't a part of, you know, it's like oh, I wish one of our students or we would have got that because that yeah. is a, that's a great deal. Yeah, that, that really is impressive. All right, let's look at a few others here. Um, let's see, 8110, and some of these are um, are just smaller lots, you know, that were purchased. Um, and uh, again, relatively small investments, um, but this is going to show that you don't necessarily have to invest tons of big money, you know, a big money in order to do really well, like this lot here, uh, 1.7 acres. This is a commercial piece of property here. Uh, you know, that was purchased for five uh, five thousand dollars, fifty seven hundred. Has an SEV of ten thousand seven hundred, so that would be like twenty two thousand uh, would be the SEV on it. So probably valued at roughly, you know, close to thirty thousand. Yeah, yeah, great deal picked up for. I mean, if we're looking at the assessed value, twenty five cents on the dollar, probably picked up more around ten cents on the dollar. Has size, has value. And we're not talking about a huge amount of money here. This was picked up for for under six grand. Uh, you know, a credible amount of profit, and the type of property where it's probably going to make sense. It's kind of right there on the verge. Would look a little bit more to the market, but it very well could make sense to take it through quiet title and get a clear title on it, get a warranty deed, so we can sell it for top dollar. Yeah, this is another property that was purchased for a pretty low price. There, um, you know, for thirty three hundred dollars. 
Yeah, yeah. At 1.34 acres. Just more vacant land. You can see it's a home lot right next to it. There's a, a home as well. Uh, would probably be selling as residential, but picked up for three grand. Probably worth, you know, picked up for around 10, 15 cents on the dollar. Uh, say it's probably worth around, you know, 25 or 30 grand. Yeah, yeah, another good example. Uh, there were also some uh, some nice little homes that sold for really inexpensive prices. In fact, um, some of the prices were surprising just how low they, they were um, in, in value. So uh, the next two we have here are actually these two homes right here. So uh, this home right here sold for 7,400. This home right here sold for 8,100. Um, and both are good usable properties here, um, you know, that have some, some value to them, but also are going to have some rent value to them, um, you know, so, uh, we have this property here, which sold for 7,400. It has an SEV of 14,000, which basically means an assessed value of about 28, 28 to 30,000, we would say here uh, on the property. And uh, really, where this property has a lot of value there is in um, its potential to be rented, you know, to be a rentable property. Yeah, really, that's where where the property, like Shade says, has value. In fact, why don't we go ahead and look at this property uh, on and look at its. Uh, check it out on uh, Google and, and check out the Zillow value as well. All right, let's see here. I think it's listed right there. I can't remember if it was this property or the next property, but it seems like one of them has photos and some information on Zillow that I can't remember exactly what it was. Um, you know, so the estimated value on this property is 47,000. Again, it was purchased for seven thousand, you know. So, uh, you know, but also important there is it has a rent estimate of about eight hundred dollars a month, um, you know. So these properties are probably going to be renting out eight hundred to a thousand dollars a month. You know, you're talking about something that somebody paid seven thousand dollars for, and you, even if you fixed it up and put some money into it, uh, put ten thousand into fixing it up, uh, you're still going to have a rental property that's going to be going up in value. Yeah, we can also see it's three bedroom, one bath. 936 square feet that's a great home to get started as a first time you know a first time investor we're not talking about a massive property we're talking about a limited amount of square feet li limited amount of rehab and and if we look at that $800 a month uh you know and they spent seven let's say eight grand it's going to pay itself off fairly quickly you know within a year it's going to pay for itself and even if we put in an, an additional five to ten grand in, in, in getting the property cleaned up, you know, that's a property that can bring in residual income and pay for itself with, within a year or two. Yeah, this is another really nice property. This one sold for $8,000. Um, it has an SCV right around the same area here. Uh, you know, there's parts of the house certainly that, that need work, but again, you didn't pay very much for it. It's been used until just, you know, in, until just recently. Yeah, in fact, that part that was a damage was actually in a attached garage. Um, but I think this property, I think this one may have had some interior photos, but there was something, I remember what it was. It was the, the uh, you can see in the original photo here online that they, that there's been a new roof put on it since the photo was taken oh yeah yeah because you see here you know they had tarps up over that and then when you look at the uh, the new the new images there on the property they they have it is in your roof yeah so you know we know that even when these photos were taken there's been a new roof put on the property uh and then also if we look uh we can see some interior photos as well which at least Ooh, gives, put the value at uh well, i guess they don't tell us the value here on it no i i think it's probably around the same you know, probably in the in the fifty to sixty thousand dollar range. Yeah, yeah. So really, all of those are some great deals um, and good examples of properties. You know, that came out of of this auction. Well, and and having that new roof. I mean, we know that that roof had to have been put on within the last three or four years. So usually that's going to be the biggest expense on one of these small homes is if you've got to redo the roof. I mean, the very low, that could be six or eight grand. It could be, you know, more than that if the home is larger than that. So having that new roof, that at least lets us know that that's been taken care of and that it, there hasn't been any water damage while the property has been sitting vacant. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all in all, though, those are lots of interesting properties to uh, to have reviewed. 
Yeah, so, yeah. An interesting sell, a lot of good properties. And, and there's a lot more that we could go over. We just kind of went through a, a few of them. There's, uh, you know, good deals being had every single week across the country. It's just a matter of, of registering and finding those auctions, participating in them. And, and really, that's kind of where part of, of tax sale support comes in to help is because we provide lists and training to be able to help uh, you know about what upcoming auctions are taking place. Yeah. So now uh, let's get into the next section that we're going to get into, which is uh, what were they thinking? This is where we look at uh, property deals where it seems like people paid too much, you know, where people may have made a mistake and may have bid uh, based on emotion rather than on, uh, you know, good solid information. Yeah, exactly. So with this particular property, um, you know, overall, they didn't spend a huge amount of money. They spent around $8,000 and it has what we like. It has, you know, it's 2.1 acres, so it has size, but there's a, a you know, a, a blaring red flag that we see right there in the beginning that really can make this lot un, unusable, at least for any type of real use, buildable, anything like that. You can't put anything on this. You might be able to put a garden, but but not much probably. Yeah. Yeah, um, and that problem is you can obviously see there are huge power lines, you know, that are uh, there on the property. And what that means is that uh, those power lines are there by virtue of an easement. And so what that basically means is the government is going to have those power lines there. You can't do anything, you know, that will interrupt or, or that, would, um, you know, that would cause any kind of problem to that. Uh, so essentially... You know, you you probably couldn't build there or anything like that because that would impede you know uh, you know their access to it. Um, you know, it really that easement is the property because so much of it is covered you know by right over you know where that line is going. Um, you know, there might be a tiny little section there on the left hand side of it um, where you know maybe part of it isn't isn't used or the you know that might be somewhat usable but it's not enough of an area there that you'd be able to use the property for anything so fortunately they didn't spend too much you know we've seen properties where they spend way too much at eight thousand you know but yeah i don't think you're going to get your money back out of it because nobody's going to pay for it yeah you know in fact uh you know really easements there's a reason why there's a lot of properties that have easements that go into the tax sale we see these type of properties all the time that really don't have any potential use. And that's the reason we say we're looking for property. We need to make sure that it has use and value. In fact, it kind of reminds me uh, a few years ago, uh, we had somebody call us up in a panic. They weren't a member. They just you know, started going online and looking and calling any type of, of tax sell uh, trainer, uh, training company, trying to find information because they had went and they had purchased a, a property that had power lines, not power lines, had a cell tower on the property. And they had purchased it thinking that they could charge these cell yeah, they, companies. They did it intentionally. Yeah, they, they, they bought it thinking that they could charge these cell providers uh, money because now they own the property, not realizing that that easement, uh, you know, allowed them to, to do it regardless if they were getting paid. They didn't have to pay them anything. And that's the reason why they let it go to the tax sale. So essentially they spent, what was it, twenty-five, twenty-six thousand dollars $26,000, if, I, if my memory is correct, on a property that that had no potential use or value. Yeah, yeah. Um, in fact, you know, really the, uh, the, the, the people that use the easement are really the ones that make out best because they don't have to own the property and they reserve the right to use it. You know, and so that's really where, you know, I mean, if you could somehow get e easements work out great, you know, whether it's for access or, you know, like with the, with the, for the electric company, you know, uh, they don't have to own that property, you know, but they still have all the benefits of the easement, you know. And so, yeah, easements are a great thing for the people using the easement, but they're not a good thing if you are, you know, buying the real estate. Yeah, man, it's definitely the kind of property we're going to avoid. And it's like Shade says, not a huge amount of money, but none of us would like to lose $8,000. Now, talking about a bad deal, let's talk about a good deal. Uh, this was a deal that was purchased by, by one of our students this week. And and overall, uh, was a pretty overall good deal. Yeah. In fact, um, yeah, this was from one of the online auctions. And uh, we saw it. So we were targeting different pieces of land here in this sale. 
Um, and this lot uh, here, which is a usable lot, that was one of the things that um, that he went through a lot of work to be able to determine to make sure of is that it was usable. Um, you know, this usable lot uh, was picked up for about ten thousand dollars. It has an assessed value of twenty eight thousand, and we think um, then, you know if we're looking at market values there. We can't find anything there for sale for under about forty thousand. So I, I don't think you're going to be able to sell for less than forty thousand. The value might be higher than that. It might be as much as as fifty or sixty. And so that's a great deal on a property you can pick up for that price range. You know, to be able to do a return like that is fantastic. Yeah, well, and, and look at this property. We have homes on either side of it. Uh, that may be a potential uh, potential buyer in buying this property. We're probably going to send out neighbor letters asking them if they're interested in buying it. Also, one thing to bring up about this sale is this property is usable and and. And the reason it's usable is because we checked or, or the student checked to make sure it was usable with the city codes. Uh, it was interesting. He was able to pick up this property that's both usable uh, through through the, the code and is accessible. And there was properties that ended up getting bid up that were similar to this property as far as the same size, but they weren't actually usable because they were a little bit irregular shaped and they didn't have enough street frontage to actually be a buildable lot because, you know, let's say you need 150 feet and they actually only had 50 feet because it was kind of a weird shaped lot. And so because of it, uh, you know, he was able to, because he went through and looked through the records and ch checked the city codes, was able to make an informed decision in buying this property where at the same auction there was people uh, that we assumed didn't look up that code because they spent two to three times as much on the same type of lot for a lot that actually wasn't buildable. Yeah, yeah, we did. We saw several lots, you know, in, in that auction that sold for, for high amounts that were not usable, so. You know, um, one thing to quickly mention as well is just down there on the bottom, uh, this was uh, one, of our, one of our website members just left this comment here on YouTube, and we want to congratulate him and thank him as well. He just says, I really appreciate your trainings been a member for a year now and have purchased seven properties in California worth a potential four to five times above purchase price. Now working through to a quiet title on the third and get it to ready to sell very soon, looking to max out profit potential. Great job. I mean, really, that's exactly what we love to hear. It's part of the reason, well, not part of it's really the number one reason we do this is me and Shade both love to be able to help others be successful. So congratulations. Yeah, that is such a cool story. So congratulations on that, that is great. Yeah, and well, congratulations to Jeffrey on this deal that he picked up this week. You know, uh, I'm sure that, you know, both of these students are gonna, are gonna make money on these deals. Right. Well, excellent. Now, uh, you know, if you haven't joined tax sales support yet you should become a member you can uh, join us on uh, tax support.com that's one of the ways that you can join uh, you can also join on uh, youtube as well yeah yeah absolutely it's only 39 dollars a month you can cancel at any time or if you want to do a year up front it's only 29 dollars a month yeah so now let's get into the next section of this here which is questions from the tube uh, this is where we uh, uh, look at different questions from uh, our youtube uh, from YouTube subscribers, uh, because a lot of times they have excellent questions that are really worth um, answering and ones that are worth spending the time on. So, you know, this is a section we've come to enjoy. Yeah, so the first question is, uh, do you have to have a lot of money to invest? Can someone still invest $100 and still benefit? And then kind of an additional question that's along the same lines is how much startup monies one needs to have to start with both tax liens and tax deeds? Yeah, it really, uh, it is a good question because um, one of the things I love about you know, about tax sales uh, is um, that they do give you the uh, the ability to access properties, real estate at low prices, really low prices. Now, a hundred dollars is a pretty low price. I don't know if we can do it with a hundred dollars, uh, but you don't have to have huge amounts, though. Um, you know, could you start with um, you know with a thousand dollars? Yeah, you can do it for a thousand dollars less, possibly. Maybe you can get deals for, um, you know, for um, properties for five hundred dollar range and uh, and you know a little above there. Um, but yeah, that's a realistic range where you can get properties. Um, you know, hundred dollars. You know, we used to be able to find deals like that in a few select areas, 
but uh, you know you got to pay up a little bit in order to find you know the deals. But you can definitely find deals for between five hundred and a thousand dollars, though. Yeah, I mean, I agree with Shane. I mean, you know, a few years ago, in fact, we've got dozens of success stories where people picked up properties for a for a hundred dollars. But I think more real, realistic, we're going to be five hundred to a thousand. Now, with tax liens, depending on the state, you know, we can maybe be able to pick up some tax liens that are worth two to, you know, around two to three hundred dollars. And it's very possible that you can find a lien that's lower than that that's that's uh, attached to a good property but that's the most important thing if we're investing in liens it has to be attached to a property that has both use and value so you know investing i'm sure you can find a a 30 dollar lien and, but it may be on a small strip of uh, land between two homes that's five feet by 150 feet and really doesn't have any use or value so in that kind of scenario you'd be better saving up your money uh, to where you have three or four or five hundred where you can invest into a property where it does have use and value. Yeah, yeah. Liens totally rely on, you know, the value of the property there, you know, that's placed against. And so, uh, yeah, I think that's an important point, you know, that you're always making sure that that initial property has enough value there that it's worth foreclosing on, you know, because that's, uh, with most liens, you know, that's basically what's going to happen is you're either going to get, uh, you know, a check in the mail when, when it redeems or, you know, you'll get the power to foreclose on the property, um, you know, after that redemption period expires. That's going to be one or the other. Yeah. So, you know, and, and if you're willing to do research, there's areas in the country where you can find property for under five hundred dollars. Uh, you know, there's a couple of different land banks that are available on our, our website. Uh, through the over-the-counter areas that students can go to and and find some different types of deals, but it is going to take a little bit more research, and it could be worth it to go ahead and save up uh, a little bit where you have a little bit more capital because you're going to be able to get a property that even has more use and value that's going to probably be easier for you to sell. Yeah. Okay. Next question here is: I have a question on land. Um, I believe it's raw land, but close to the the small town. So I worry if I bought it, um, if it would cost too much to have electricity put out there uh, or like is somebody willing to buy uh, raw land to flip? Uh, it's a good question. Uh, I think, you know, they're, they're, I'm concerned about maybe having land uh, that uh, I guess they're worried if it's going to be too far out there, if it's too far from things like utilities. Yeah, and that's not something that worries us. The only thing that worries us is, is it usable? And so, you know, when it comes to land that's out in the country, out in a rural area, that's what makes tax sale investing different is we'll buy property anywhere. We don't even care if there's nothing but rattlesnakes and sagebrush as long as it has a significant value and it has people that are willing to be able to buy it, which most land that has use will have some type of value. So if we're getting it cheap enough, then we're really open to anywhere. So when it comes to something like raw land, if it is something like a building lot, we're going to want to check to make sure that it can be used as a building lot. Otherwise, we're going to have to figure out some other type of value, uh, you know, uh, some other type of use for it. You know, maybe you can do it for recreational or something like that. But if it's not buildable or not usable, then it's going to be something that we would avoid. But if it's not, if it is, then we don't really care where it's located as long as it has use and value and we're getting it for cheap enough then you can always turn around and sell it and make a good profit. Yeah, excellent. Now, next question here. Um, once these properties go up for auction, have they been seized by the county and are they vacant? Uh, this is a great question uh, because I think it kind of speaks to trying to understand the process the properties are going through. So uh, have they been seized by the county? Well, they've been foreclosed on uh, you know, through a judicial foreclosure. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they have been uh, that they're vacant. You know, some of them are vacant uh, sometimes, just because uh, you know maybe there's nobody there. But the county doesn't actually go through a vacating process there, where they're kicking people out of the house. No, no, no. I mean, Shade's exactly right. So when the property goes through a foreclosure, it's going to go through a judicial foreclosure. But like Shade said, they're not going to evict anyone. Uh, if the property is vacant when they sell it, then you're going to be purchasing the property vacant. If it's occupied, then a lot of times, you know, they're going to even have notes as far as like Michigan or New York or place like that. that you can drive by, but don't enter or access the property because it is still occupied. Now, 
if it's vacant, then essentially once you receive the deed, you can get an, access to the property and start doing what you're going to do with it. If the property is occupied, then we really need to go over a, kind of a few different steps. Usually we're going to send them out some type of certified letter letting them know that we're the new owner and kind of finding out what their situation is. A lot of times we'll give them a couple of different options. Uh, one of those options is potentially rent the property. Uh, another option is is to give them some cash for, for cash for keys, what we call cash for keys, which essentially means, hey, we're going to give you 500 or a thousand bucks if you're willing to go ahead and move out, give you some money to find a new place, give us the keys, and don't try to don't wreck the property up as, as you're moving out. The third option could be a potential seller financing option if the person living in the property if it's, if it's the right kind of deal and that's what you're interested in. Uh, otherwise, if they don't take those three options, then we're going to have to contact the sheriff and have them evicted. Okay, and uh, final question here. Um, hey, y'all, great podcast. I've seen in past sales at my county, there have been streets and highways that have been sold. What could be a possible exit strategy if I were to buy those and say I didn't get paid back? Uh, you know, as far as that particular question, uh, we 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 don't buy them. We see things like roads come up, highways. Uh, kind of talking a little bit when we were talking about easements as well. That's what it is. It's an easement. When we were talking about that that property in the what were they thinking uh, section uh, with the power lines, that was an easement property, and that kind of fits underneath that same category when it comes to a street or a highway. It's just an easement. Yeah, basically, so we would consider it useless land. We would avoid properties like that to begin with uh, just because, yeah, the problem there is that, that, yeah, they can't really be used outside of that, so they don't really have any true value. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, go ahead and ask questions in the comment section. Maybe your questions will be featured on one of our next videos. If not, we'll try to go through and answer or at least uh, touch base on any one of your comments. Yeah, but that's everything we have here for uh, for this week's podcast. Uh, we appreciate you watching here to the very end. Uh, be sure to comment on the video. Tell us what you liked uh, or, uh, you know, which section there. Uh, I guess we had a lot of different things you could comment on during the video. Uh, but, yeah, be sure to comment on it somewhere there. And uh, and thanks for, for watching. Yeah, appreciate it again. And we'll go ahead and, and get a new episode out next week. See you then.